this set up so I can see all of you guys. Um, okay, so this morning we're going to talk about kind of evaluation of hip and knee patients. If you guys have been, all of you guys that have been on service already, um, have kind of done some of this with like uh, the Tuesday morning lecture. We always give this one anyway, where we kind of go over how to evaluate patients, but this will be a little bit different. Um, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about the nuance of evaluating uh, a hip and knee, or I guess a knee patient, but, but hip and knee. And then we'll go over radiographs a little more. Um, and I also want to show you guys a little bit about kind of implant identification for knees, because um, it's pretty easy and there's only like four main systems. And if you guys can start picking up what the systems are, you'll look, you'll look like superstars and things. So um, show you a couple of tricks with that. Um, so we'll spend 50 minutes on this and then we'll move to a, a big group and we'll talk more about knee biomechanics. Um, but please interrupt and um, ask questions. And this is very informal, okay? Uh, okay, so outlines of what we're doing, go over clinical evaluation, physical exam, radiographs, pre-op planning, and then also uh, just the lingo of how to identify some implants and what the uh, arthroplasty wording for things is. So you guys know there's a lot of knee problems. Um, churches, why do you think there's more knee OA than hip OA? Uh, because the anatomic and mechanical axis uh, don't necessarily line up. So you're predisposed um, and the knee, the knee joint uh, sits in a little bit of valgus. Yeah, I haven't thought of it that way. That's one reason. That, that may be the underlying biomechanical reason. The, the kind of the, the other reason that I would say is that the knee is kind of a sloppy joint, right? So it's not as good of a design joint as a ball and socket joint. There's a lot of shear in it. Um, and it's also more prone to trauma and it's more prone to the effects of obesity. So, you know, as obesity increases more and more knee problems um, as opposed to hip, the hip's a little bit more protected. It's not kind of seen uh, as much on a day-to-day -day basis um, stresses. So usually hip arthritis is more of a it's either some sort of developmental issue or it's some sort of like, you know, maybe cartilage issue that we haven't really figured out yet. Like you, there's more of a family history in hip arthritis than there is knee arthritis. Um, okay. And then there's a lot of things that can affect a knee joint besides just simple OA, right? Inflammatory arthropathies, crystalline arthropathies. Um, the crystalline arthropathy one is one that's actually probably underdiagnosed. Um, we think of gout as like big toe. Um, but pseudogout is probably in the knee a lot more than we think. And there was actually a study that came out that they aspirated all these arthritic knees and 50% of them had pseudogout crystals at the time of a, a joint replacement. So, you know, that's probably just an underdiagnosed issue is the pseudogout. You see it a lot in the meniscus and things when it turns hard. Um, so definitely more common. And then AVN and neuropathic joints too. So, um, hey, Marcus, you can go to the senior group if you want. Um, yeah, do you have that link? Um, I can probably find it. I'm sure it's in an email. It was in the chat somewhere too. I don't know if you can see the old chat, but yeah, you can head over there if you want. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, Ellen, what do you think are some of the goals of a knee replacement? Um, so you want to restore the anatomic, um, or well, you want to recreate the joint line, I guess. And then you want to- Alan Is that true? Are you even hang out with Beanie too much? Um, like not the anatomic joint line, but just to ensure that it's the same on the medial and lateral side. Um, so so hold on. So what what are you getting at here? What are what are you trying to what are we trying to say? Like balance the gaps. <laughs> you're dropping you're dropping a lot of knowledge. It's just not in the kind of right context here. So. Um, so I think what you're trying to say is you're trying to establish the mechanical axis of the leg, right? Is that kind of what you're saying? You want to get the joint perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the limb? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and you want to have a balanced knee. That was also what you were getting at, right? With the balanced gaps. Okay. What are some other maybe more, more overarching goals of a knee replacement surgery? Yeah, like decreased pain. Um, yeah. The function with good range of motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other thing would be you want it to last a long time, right? So you want something that's stable, you want something that's pain free, and we're putting it in it's a piece of metal and plastic, it's got to last a long time. So those are the, the main goals of a knee replacement. Um, 
So with that in mind, kind of going into a room, uh, Joey, you're going to go into a room, you're, you're in Dr. Hansen's clinic, and he says, go see this patient. If you have some time beforehand, what's some information that you might want to pick up before you walk in and talk to the patient? Um, I mean, just look through the chart as much as you can get a sense of how healthy of a person they are. Um, always try and look at the x-rays before you go in. Um, and then obviously you'll get more of the story about pain and function from them. But um, I think the chart biopsy just to generally see what their health is like is important. Yeah, past medical history is good. Past surgical history, if you have access to it. Um, I would say imaging, if you have access to it. Um, if they have a bunch of labs that are coming in with, you know, not all these patients are going to be primary, you know, NEOA patients. If they have prior labs, trying to get all that stuff, trying to see all their imaging before you go in, you don't want to be digging for all that stuff while you're trying to talk to the patient and you can get, a, get an idea of what's been done and what hasn't. Um, now, when you're taking a history, um, you know, you have to ask the patient a lot of these questions, right? So you, you got to take the history, review the records. Um, and, and kind of get to know what each individual patient's goals are. I think that's a big part of the arthroplasty clinic is trying to align what our expectations and goals are of what we can do with a surgery with what a patient wants to get out of it. So everybody comes in with different expectations. Some people wanna be able to run 15 miles. Other people wanna be able to walk to their mailbox in the morning. Other people wanna be able to transfer from a wheelchair to the bed, right? So everybody's kind of bar is different. And so as physicians, we have to kind of find where are you at and where can we get you to? Um, so I think that's more, even potentially more important than finding out where is their pain, kind of what's going on. Um, admittedly, a lot of an arthroplasty, you can figure out just from a radiograph. You don't need to talk to the patient to feel, to figure out what's going on with their leg. Um, but the expectation part of it definitely is, is a big part of the history take. Um, all right, and then capacity for compliance with treatment is, Maybe trauma, maybe like cold trauma is the only thing where that's more important than in joints is the ability for people to kind of adhere to precautions and, and post-op things. Um, so make sure they're sitting down when you're taking a history. Um, all right, uh, Hunter, what kind of stuff are we gonna ask him? Just give me the basics of arthritis, kind of what you wanna ask him for the history. Sure, so you, know, you wanna know uh, kind of the onset of their pain. Um, kind of the characteristic of it. Um, you wanna know um, how long it's been going on, um, what type of activity it prevents them from doing. Uh, and then you wanna know uh, what they've done for the pain. So, you know, if they've taken NSAIDs, if they've gotten any injections, uh, if they've had surgery in the knee before, stuff like that. Yeah, basic stuff, location, duration, intensity, what makes it worse? How is it affecting their life, right? Like what, did, what can't they do because of their knee? I like to ask people, like, if your knee wasn't bothering, what activities would you be doing? You know, and if they come back with, like, well, I'd be running marathons, but they're 80 years old and they haven't run for 20 years. You know, that kind of goes to, like, what are their expectations and how much do we have to realistically bring them back to, to earth? Um, and then the prior treatments. So things that they tried, medications, injections, bracing, therapy, all that stuff. All that stuff's important to document. Um, and then the other thing, I, you know, ask them what they think is the problem. A lot of people always come back to, oh, when I was in high school, I was playing football and I got hit. And ever since then, my knee's been bad. Or, you know, I was, I was working for Amazon, carrying boxes all day. And ever since, like, my knees become arthritic, right? You know, like getting to an idea of what they think caused their problem. And you don't have to call them out for, like, there's no way that that's what, what caused it. But, you know, trying to figure out where they're coming from. And then, um, you know, see, trying to get a sense for what their medical literacy is in terms of how the arthritis um, starts. So, uh, Dr. Ali, if you were going to try and explain how arthritis works to a patient, so someone's got NEOA, explain to me as a, as a lay person what's going on with osteoarthritis, what's happened to my knee. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll basically tell them, you know, your knee is a joint, which means it's two bones that are together and they can move. And uh, we have this thing called cartilage lining the joints, which kind of provides lubrication and allows it to move freely. And over time, there's wear and tear of that cartilage. And that causes kind of inflammation, which causes the nerve endings that are around there to, you know, send pain to your brain. 
So our goal, you know, if we were to do a total knee replacement is to remove the cartilage that is sending those pain signals. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is like, just making sure they understand there's cartilage on the end of your bone that's normally kind of the cushions and the smooth uh, substance that allows them to move freely. And with arthritis, it's gone. And the other thing that's important to kind of stress to patients is once cartilage is gone, it's gone, right? You can't make it come back. You can't inject anything to make it grow back despite what you see on late night TV and all this stuff. So I think that's the biggest thing to stress with the pathophysiology is you need cartilage for a knee to function properly. Once it's gone, it's gone and you can't make it come back. Um, and then when it's gone, it causes the knee to be very angry, right? So the bones touching release these substances makes the knee angry and it hurts. So kind of breaking it down as much as you can use as little like medical lingo as possible. Um, and then you'll, you'll feel the patients out, right? If they're, if they're a retired physician, you can be more in depth, but it, patients only take away 10% of um, when we're in, when we're looking at a patient, obviously you get a lot of this from just looking at them. And while you're doing the talking, just kind of getting a sense for how they're sitting, how they kind of hold themselves. Um, I always try to get people when they're walking in and out of the clinic to Sorry about that. I just got kicked off. Um, Aviana, is it still sharing? It's not still sharing. Um, Aviana, what are some special tests on a knee that you'd want to? Um, for osteoarthritis or for just in general, I guess. For... Hello? I do. Sorry. Let me see if I stop my video, if I can uh, fix this. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, can so, I mean, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, uh, I guess like special tests, um, I would wanna do like um, the telephone compression to see if that's where maybe most of their, their pain is. Um, Usually, and then I also want to, um, I guess not necessarily special, but like uh, valve distress to, to uh, embarrass to evaluate uh, their MCO. Um, which, otherwise one test, which one tests the MCO? Sorry, um, I'm going to test um, valve distress for the MCO. The valve is directed stress, yeah. And so how do you do that? So what, I... What position take, do you hold the knee? Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm gonna put that in um, 30 degrees. Yeah, you wanna bend it a little bit, right? Not yeah. full extension. Yep, okay. So you should check varus valgus. Um, um, so mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, patellofemoral, I wanna see, um, to see if they have, that's where most of their pain is. Um, I'm gonna also see like, you know, medial joint, medial lateral joint line uh, tenderness. Um, what is also like, what is their general range of motion? Um, uh, also, I guess I uh, omit it, like look at their skin and their like feel their pulses to see if they have any like I don't know like a, a, a vascular path, but you probably know that from the history more so um, as well. Um, yeah, there are special tests. Um, so you want to know uh, ACL PCL, right? Uh, yeah. So you can check those. Uh, well, I guess is that well. Well, I guess my question is for if you're going to do a joint replacement. Um, I guess I was thinking more so like for a patient, um, like OA patient that you're going to do joint replacement for. Is that still 
um, I guess, how does that help you? Um, like, I mean, you're, you're going to do it, but I mean, what are you thinking about in terms of joint replacement in that sense? Well, so because because aren't they going to have a usually they have ACL um, laxity like anterior drawer? Well, so uh oh, you're saying after a joint replacement? Yeah. So after a joint replacement, most joint replacements you would sacrifice the ACL. However, what situations can you think of where that would be very important to know if the ACL is competent? about partials. Oh, I said you're not going to do a partial joint replacement. Yeah, I so think, yeah. if, if they yeah. don't have an ACL, then that kind of uh, knocks them out of the camp of a partial. So say they have medial OA, it's important to know if their ACL is functional. Um, it also can point to a lot of people won't have, um, you know, severe arthritis, but they can, you know, one less common indication for a joint replacement is ligamentous instability um, and having instability of the knee. So it's another thing. If they grossly lose ACL, PCL, it's something that you want to know. And then a lot of knee replacements don't replace the PCL. So, um, you know, you need, it's good to know if the PCL is functional before or after. Um, the other tests that are important to know that you'll, you'll use frequently in a joint replacement clinic are kind of the meniscal specific tests. So Apley's and Thessaly and um, McMurray's using those to kind of differentiate meniscal pathology from arthritis. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah. So, uh, you know, things that you should observe in the clinic that is important to tell the attending before we go in, but we'll obviously see them too. But, you know, if you see skin pop popping lesions or, you know, just getting a general sense for as the patient look their chronological age, are they older or younger? Um, how do they get up from a chair? Are they using supports? You know, what kind of shoes are they wearing? Are they wearing flip-flops and complaining that their heels, their feet hurt and their knees hurt? Or are they wearing like, you know, those Olsen Hoka shoes? You know, it just gives you a sense for how much involved they've been to this point to try and make things feel better. I mean, a lot of the stuff you're not going to document, but it's just going towards how appropriate is this person for a knee replacement or not. Um, when they're walking, uh, Sergio, describe to me what, what is the typical gait for a arthritic knee? Um, can you unmute Jeff? Sorry, me and Joe are next to each other. Um, so typically I think they will have like a lurch where they lurch to the opposite side of their pain. So if they have like a varus knee, then they'll do like a lateral lurch. So if you, if you just, if you describe it as a lurch, um, people will be confused. So what's the typical way, if you're talking to another orthopedic surgeon that you want to describe that you would describe a arthritic knee gait? It'd be like antalgic, antalgic. Yeah. Okay. What's what's even a more specific one? Does anybody know how you could describe it? Like shortened stand space. Yeah. I mean, that's the same thing as antalgic, right? Thinking specifically uh, for a varus knee uh, that could have a lateral thrust. Uh, yeah. They walk. You, can have, you can have some thrusting. Yeah. But so the. Uh, Dr. Ward loves this. He calls it a coxalgic gait, which means a limping gait because of your knee. So coxalgic would be the, the technical term for a knee pathology causing a limp antalgic gait. So coxalgic gait. Um, all right. Uh, and that's just a shorter stance phase. It's just limping a little bit. Um, often they'll start smoothing out as they get moving. When you talk about a lurch, lurch is more of a kind of muscle issues. Um, when you're, when you're talking lurch, they're like really throwing their weight over to the other side and is usually related to abductor weakness, um, more kind of a hip issue gait than it would be a knee gait in general. Um, and then the thrusting can happen when you have a lot of laxity in the knees. <clears throat> All right. Uh, important to look at the leg and get the scar, look for any prior scars or prior surgeries. A lot of people will not mention that. So you have to look for these things. Um, contractures are really important. Uh, so what is the standard uh, way that we describe the range of motion of a knee, Joey? If we say, if I say the patient's, uh, well, so a patient has a 10 degree contracture, flexion contracture, what does that mean? And if they have full flexion and you're writing down the range of motion, what numbers are you going to write down for a 10 degree flexion? 
Sure. So, I, so full range of motion at baseline, I guess I think of from like zero to 130, 135. So if they have a 10 degree flexion contracture, I would write it as 10 to 135. Good. Uh, yeah, don't write negative 10 to 125, right? 135. And then what's the difference between a contracture and a lag? Yeah, so a flexion contracture, you cannot, uh, you can't correct passively when you're looking at passive range of motion. And then an extensor lag, you can correct, but actively they, they will not be able to fully extend. Yeah, so a contracture is a loss of passive range of motion, right? And a lag is a loss of active range of motion. So yeah, really important. And so usually we describe that as like, you know, if you have a 30 degree lag, that means you can't go the last 30 degrees of your passive range of motion. Now that may be like, you're still 50 degrees short of full extension, but that's kind of the difference is usually the difference between the active and the passive. Um, all right. Now, uh, who can describe, Alejandro, can you uh, describe pseudo laxity versus laxity and what the difference might be? Um, sure, I can try. I think for, um, you can say I don't. I'm honestly know. not sure, but my, my yeah. best educated guess would be that laxity is a true uh, ligamentous injury that's leading to an issue where they have an exam finding, whereas uh, pseudo laxity would be potentially more of like a sprain rather than like a, a true um, tear of one of the, the ligaments, but I'm you're not close. sure. To be you're close. The first, your de definition of laxity is correct, right? So it's a true ligamentous injury um, where you have uh, incompetent ligament, but Sarah, what's a pseudo lax? What's, what's the difference there? Yeah. Uh, so pseudo laxity, like if you look at that bad ferrous knee, you might open to valgus because of bone loss, but it's not because the MCL is incompetent. It's because you have changed the volume in the medial joint in another way. Exactly. So this medial side has collapsed because you've lost cartilage and bone, but the ligament may still be normal. So you can stress that and replace kind of realign the knee and often you'll still have a good endpoint. So it feels like you're opening to a valgus stress, right? So if you're if you're moving the tibia outside to the lateral direction, that medial side feels like it's loose, feels like it's loose, feels like it's loose, and then there's a good medial catch. So that's pseudo, pseudo laxity where the ligament is competent, but it's only opening up that however much because of arthritis. Um, so it's a big, it's an important distinction. What's another thing that's important to describe if someone has a, a deformity? So say they're very varus, um, Sarah, you have some pseudo laxity, but what's another kind of qualifier that you can, can use often? Like how passively correctable it is? Yeah, exactly. Very good. So you kind of want to document fully correctable to neutral versus, you know, partially correctable. And the difference, what, why does that matter? Maybe if you're considering doing a joint replacement. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, you're thinking about um, your implants and like what you're going to have to do to balance that knee intraoperatively. And so are you going to get it with bone cuts and then have stable ligaments? Very good. Yeah. So if it's a pseudo lax knee, that's kind of fully correctable, that's going to be a very easy day. You're not going to have to do a lot of releases. You just have to make the bone cuts, fill in the spaces and things will align versus something that's contracted and not uh, fully correctable, um, you're going to have a tough time. You're going to have to do some releases or something with true laxity with no endpoint is going to mean that you're going to need more constraint in the knee. Um, so those are really important to do. Skin evaluation, not only finding where all the scars are, but also figuring out if you can, if the patient remembers when they were, right? And when each one was separately. So if someone comes in with this knee, the big medial scar and a big lateral scar, really important to know what, or really helpful to know what was the last uh, last one used. Why, why might that matter, Ellen? Why, why if this was, say this person has a total knee in there and we're going to go do a revision, they have this big lateral scar and this big medial scar. Which one would you prefer to use from a surgical perspective, but which one is going to be, uh, if you have no idea when they were, which one would you have to use? Um, I think usually I'd want to use the medial scar. But um, that, that'd be for surgery reasons, right? Because it's just easier to do a medial parapetellar arthrotomy. But yeah, why would you not be able to use that. Um, 
So if it the, I'm not sure, but I think it has to do with like the blood supply. Yeah, so the blood supply, uh, let's see, there's a better picture. So the blood supply comes from medial to lateral. So say that um, if you were to use this incision and this one had done been done after the first one, and then you go back in and use this medial one, if the blood supply can't come from over here, a lot of times this section in the middle will die. So you have to use the lateral most incision to allow whatever you know, blood supply was needed coming from this area to stay there. So um, if you know that this was the incision used last, this medial one, and that middle section already survived once, then you're, you're okay. You can use it again, because you know that it already un, under, like it withstood kind of losing that blood supply in the sec, center section. But if they did the lateral incision after the medial, you got to go back in the lateral one, um, which is a pain in the butt. So knowing, knowing the order. Um, and then also when you're doing this kind of thing, you know, Hanson will get on you guys to leave no fat on the fascia. And this is the reason why, right? So if you look at where the blood supply comes, it's from the muscle through the fascia and then into these kind of crossing subcutaneous fat vessels that get, then goes up to the skin. So you want to kind of come in the bottom so that these kind of crossing vessels uh, stay intact. If you kind of go in and out of these crossing vessels, all that blood supply to the skin can get disrupted. So um, that's why he's he's pretty anal about it. It's not um, it's not like one layer of fat. This is kind of higher up in the fat actually. So you're not really killing the skin. So don't kill yourself if you get into the fat a little bit. But um, you do want to be close to the fascia. Um, okay. So in summary, we looked at alignment, range of motion, stability, prior scars. Doing a neurovascular exam is important, um, and that's that's important for physical exam. So. Um, we're gonna go through some cases here. Actually, this is this is for physical exam still. So patient has uh, you know these x-rays of their knee. They underwent a knee replacement in an outside hospital, still painful. Um, on exam, what things might you wanna do for a prosthetic knee to get a better sense of why this thing's painful? Uh, buh, buh, buh. Uh, Alex. So you have a sense of why it's painful. Um, so what do any what exam maneuvers are different for a, a total knee versus a regular knee? Exam maneuvers for a total knee versus a regular knee. So this is just exam. Yeah, just what are you going to examine this patient? Or how are you going to examine this patient? I think of I have like my definitely my bread and butter exam. A lot of things we've talked about inspection, yeah. um, palpation. We want to look at range of motion. Um, and so we talked about. Is there an extensor lag? Um, yeah. And uh, are there any like remaining contractures? Um, yeah. For total knees, you'd want to look at the stability, um, see if they yeah. have um, any pseudo laxity or just gross laxity. Um, and then you can also look at uh, patellar tracking as well, which we did resurface the patella, I believe. Um, and so you'd want to see if the patella is also tracking on the appropriate knee. Yeah, so things that are different for a total knee. When you're talking about laxity, we usually don't talk about, um, we usually talk about how much we feel like the joint is opening to each direction, right? So when you check varus or valgus, you, you kind of describe how, how big of an opening do you feel like there is between the components. In flexion at 90, we usually check that kind of polo test. So you kind of pull the knee forward and back um, and see how loose that feels to you. Um, you can check patellar tracking. You just put your hand on the patella and feel if it's going down the middle. Um, the x-rays can help you, like this one's tilting, but you might not be able to feel that tilt on exam, um, but you can tell if it's in the groove or not or dislocating lags like you're talking about. And then when you're doing palpation with a total knee, you can. it's really important to kind of get right at that interface of the implant and the bone, which you can generally tell. Um, and kind of see where they're tender. A lot of times with loosening, you'll be able to elicit tenderness right at the implant bone interface. So it's important to, to describe that. And then, you know, if you saw these x-rays that went on to a knee, why might I say, well, it's kind of expected this person's still going to be painful. Sarah, why, why do these x-rays, if a patient came in with these x-rays prior to this total knee, why would I say, well, not, not too unexpected? 
I mean, when I look at those x-rays, I don't see like gobsmacking arthritis. And yeah. so I would say like, maybe we didn't operate at them on like at the right point in their time course, basically. Yeah, correct. And what else on physical exam might this drive you? So if this person came in to you originally with these x-rays and knee pain, what other physical exam things have we not talked about that maybe should be a part of your routine exam? Hmm. Like you thinking of like other non bony causes or other non knee causes yeah. of knee pain. So right? like referred pain from the hip, like radicular yeah. pain from the spine. Yeah. So those should be a part of your workup all the time, even in knees that look terrible, making sure that you're ruling out the hip and ruling out the spine. So a lot of that'll come from history, but also a quick physical exam, right? So bend their knee to 90 and then rotate their hip and push it to internal and external rotation limits and see if that hurts. Um, you know, and if it does, then you need to look at the hip. So this patient had had this knee x-ray, had had this knee done, was still painful a year out and because this is what their hip looked like. This is like the actual patient. And so they had a hip replacement in their knee. Um, so that, that's not an uncommon occurrence that help, happens regularly. So always check the joint, especially. If you're okay. Um, all right. So moving on to knee x-rays, um, we got like 15 minutes. So Non-weight-bearing films, worthless, right? So this is the same, same person, a non-weight-bearing film and a weight-bearing film. Um, so whenever someone comes from a PCP with a non-weight-bearing film, just repeat it. It, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, so a good AP is a standing view, straight shot straight, uh, not straight on, but down at about a seven degree angle. And that's to get the uh, tibia on axis with the slope. Um, the Rosenberg view uh, is a bent knee PA. This is the most sensitive for knee arthritis. So early knee arthritis is gonna show up first on this bent knee view, um, a posterior bent knee view. So again, these are the same patient with a standing AP and a PA bent knee. And you can see that's often where you'll see that medial OA pattern the soonest. Um, lateral x-rays, things that you're looking for are posterior fights, looking at the size of the posterior offset of the femur. So some people have a huge posterior condylar offset. Some people have very small. That's going to be predictive of kind of their size and surgery. You want to look at the level of the patella, Baja versus Alta. Uh, Baja knee is going to be a, a longer OR day. That's just a pain in the butt to get exposure. Um, you're looking at the tibial slope and you're also looking at the wear pattern. Um, if you can't tell which side is the lateral side, some little cheats, uh, usually the, there's a little notch in the, the distal femur on the lateral side. So then you can follow that side around. Uh, the medial side is also larger than the lateral side in general and goes more inferior. So, you know, if you look at the tibia, this is the tibia on the medial side, this is the tibia on the lateral side. You can tell the medial bone's not gonna go through the tibia. So this is also another way you can tell medial side. Um, patellofemoral view, we're looking at tracking, we're looking at the thickness, um, we're looking at the trochlear shape, not always the best uh, ways to figure those things out. Um, a lot of us will get knee alignment films for, for certain cases um, uh, to look at the overall mechanical axis of the knee. Uh, don't, don't look at that other knee, I'm not sure whose knee that is, but that's very... Bent. <clears throat> so when we're getting the, the distal femoral axis, uh, we're trying to find the difference between the anatomic and the mechanical, right? So um, the anatomic is how we assess it intraoperatively. And we talked about that in the lab last week. And then the mechanical is what you're shooting for. So on average, that's about five degrees for most people. All right. When you're describing knee x-rays, uh, well, these are the buzzwords that, that you used to have to have in there and you still do for insurance companies to approve surgery is you have to write something like this to describe arthritis. So osteophytes, sclerosis, subchronal cysts, joint space narrowing. Um, you can also write their alignment or their pattern of arthritis, varus versus valgus versus concentric. Um, and then the compartments involved. Um, who can describe Kellgren lawrence grading? Anybody? Churches? What's the KL grading system? Yeah, so it's uh, on a scale of zero to four, um, kind of just progressively worsening arthritis as you move up. So zero is none. Um, one is 
unlikely. Arthritis too is kind of mild. Uh, you might start, start to see some like posterior changes on that notch view. Um, and then three is where you start getting some of that joint space narrowing. Um, you might see some subchondral sclerosis. Uh, and then four is just frank degenerative changes with any and all of the buzzwords that we mentioned. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of, you can kind of think of it as mild, moderate, severe, you know, starting at grade two, kind of mild, grade three, moderate, kind of partial thickness narrowing, and then grade four is, is severe, and then looking at fights and things and sclerosis and, and the whatnot. So um, the radiologists put this in all their notes now. Um, this was defined off of like 18 patients um, on some like 18 white male patients from like the 70s or something. Is was you know it's not always applicable to all patterns of arthritis. Um, there was a good paper uh, on machine learning looking at joint uh, replacement patients and their preoperative exams and the intraoperative findings. Um, and the the end result of it was that a lot of um, maybe non uh, white male patients their pattern of arthritis isn't necessarily going to fit into this classic kind of. OA KL grading pattern, but they may still have severe cartilage loss. So just important to know that um, this isn't always going to describe every person with bad arthritis. Some people will have kind of a ton of uh, pseudo gout. And so you'll see their meniscus is really bright and they have tons of osteophytes, but they still have joint space. Some people will have um, kind of joint space loss in areas that aren't picked up by the classic x-rays. So like a lot of lateral pattern arthritis is in full flexion that you're never going to get on an x-ray, but will show up on an MRI, for example. So um, this isn't the end all. Okay, so uh, uh, Kaz, why don't you describe these films? Yeah, for sure. Um, so it looks like we're looking at an AP of bilateral knees. I'm not sure whether it's standing, to be honest. I think usually you try to look for a, a marker to indicate that. Um, okay. But it looks like just grossly looking at it, it looks like these knees are in varus um, alignment. Um, bilaterally, they both have basically obliteration of the medial joint space. On, it, it, like, it's a little hard to tell. They might, honestly, they might even be fused, but unclear without being able to see the patient themselves, but at least complete obliteration of the joint line and some um, subchondral sclerosis, um, some pretty large osteophytes on the medial side as well as the lateral side. It also looks like the, the femur is um, displaced uh, medially bilaterally compared to the tibia. You can sort of see like some of the tibial plat the lateral tibial plateau is sticking out, although that could just be very large osteophyte. Um, there's so good. much. Going yeah, no, on. that's good. But <laughs> the biggest things are you got a severe varus deformity. You got full thickness cartilage loss, especially medial. You can even say that you're starting to get some tibial bone loss, right? So this is probably eroding into the tibia a little bit, and then subluxation of the femur medially on the on the tibia. So the reason that happens is that you're starting to get that MCL is kind of collapsing, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not under tension. And so you're kind of just sliding until that MCL gets a little bit of tension. Um, and the lateral side in the process is stretching out. So this person's going to have a really stretched out lateral side, but yeah, good job. Um, versus this, which is the opposite pattern. This is going to be a valgus knee OA pattern, right? Or this is a, a pretty severe valgus knee pattern. So with this, you're getting full thickness, cartilage loss laterally, osteophytes lateral, sclerosis lateral. Um, and then, uh, you know, if, and when you're doing the exam on this one, it's important to see if their MCL is competent. A lot of these will kind of stretch out their MCL that there's then a soft endpoint. Um, compared to this, which is more of a kind of concentric on both sides pattern, uh, probably more of a inflammatory type pattern. Um, and then this guy had a, had a scope, so don't scope old people. <laughs> Got us an avian lesion. Um, Sergio, what do you think the diagnosis is here? You get you get one word. Charcot. 
There you go. Yeah. yeah. So it's a neuropathic joint, um, most likely. Um, just kind of total destruction of both sides. And, or it could be a, a bad infection, but probably shark <clears throat> This is that chondrocalcinosis that you can often see that the cartilage in these knees is not healthy and not normal because um, they're basically, that's like bone on bone. It's just the cartilage is turned into bone. Um, anyone know what that is? It's called a kinna spring. Some sports surgeon came up with this and thought it was a good idea. It's like a spring that tries to jack open the medial side and it has two ball bearings here and here. This was not created in the 70s. This was created like four or five years ago by a sports surgeon. And as you can imagine, has caused all kinds of problems because of the stupid metal, metal bearing um, and because it looks dumb and doesn't work. So you see weird stuff. Um, we're gonna skip this in the setting of time. Uh, just real quick talking about um, different types of implants. So cemented versus cementless, right? You should be able to see the kind of fluff, the fluffy cement around an implant. If you see these kind of short square pegs, that's always a cementless kind of, you can check the button too. A lot of metal back patellas are giving you a clue that this is a cementless knee. Um, these are all kind of styles of cementless knees with these short pegs. Some of them had screws back in the day, or this is the Zimmer one that's square peg. Um, fixed versus mobile bearing. This is just kind of definitions for you guys. So fixed bearing, the tibial tray has a groove that you can lock in the poly. Mobile bearing is a flat surface with a post down the center that it can spin on. Okay. So this would be a fixed bearing x-ray. This would be a mobile bearing x-ray where you have that flat tibial surface. PS versus CR, you're looking for the box versus the pegs. Um, and then deep dish is this one in the middle. So CR knee is sort of flat. You're relying on the PCL to pull you back. We'll talk about this in the next lecture a little bit. Uh, deep dish is kind of, has a big anterior lip that kind of pushes you back as you flex. And a PS, the post on cam is what holds you back. Um, you can't tell the difference between a CR and a deep dish on an X-ray. Um, CCK or semi-constrained are these knees that have these kind of posts up the center that are thicker. They often have a reinforcement post. So when you, whenever you see one of these, you should be thinking that this is probably a semi-constrained knee. Um, and then that's different than a hinge, which is actually linked. So there's a, there's a link and a hinge. And all hinges have some sort of rotating platform. They have some sort of rotating ability um, to offload some of the stresses. A DFR is a hinge that's replacing the condyles. Um, and they're all going to be rotating hinges. Sleeves versus augments, so our sleeves versus cones. This is a cone. A cone is separate from the implant. You put a cone in and then you cement through it. A sleeve is a part of the implant. It's on the, on the actual implant attached. Um, so this sleeves usually have Have these kind of step appearances where it's kind of just a different link, but um, in three minutes we'll go through biomechanics of these. I'll send this out to you guys so you have, have this if you want, but this is the puny has kind of this rounded base. The side, the box is up at a slope. Striker knee, this is what Beanie and Hansen used to use. This is the revision base plate versus the standard base plate, but you should be able to recognize this base plate. This is a biomet knee always has this stupid bar across the front. It's called a Vanguard. This is the Smith and Nephew knee, has a very distinct tibial shape, long, thin keel. Um, and then Zimmer has this plastic plug on the bottom. So you always see this kind of opening and their keel is also a distinct shape. It's very anterior and kind of circular. Uh, that's a sleeve. With a CC with a TC3, so a semi-constrained sleeves. That's going to be a CCK. The Zimmer thing has a kind of box and a straight peg. The DFR striker, Zimmer Smith nephew, the Pew <coughs> striker. 
that's a all poly tibia. Okay, I'll see you guys in a few minutes on the other other screen. Okay. <laughs>